Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book entitled Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards. This book is a biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Mertie, who both were born in 1878 and led an exciting life of service and mission in the early days of the young and rapidly growing Seventh-day Adventist Church. In our last reading, we covered chapter 13, entitled, In War and in Peace, when the revolution that overthrew the 267-year-old Manchu dynasty occurred. For a while, the Cottrells were relatively safe in their island home and mission, and were able to offer refuge to other missionaries and groups. But as the violence and fighting grew, first Murti and then Roy had to seek refuge in Shanghai. After the fighting settled down, they returned to Changsha, where they found that the difficult times of war and change had produced a veritable harvest of new believers not only in Changsha, but also deep into the interior. This required them to make a journey to meet the new believers, conduct baptisms, and establish new churches. The trip lasted many months and took them through difficult yet happy times. They traveled by land and river, across deserts and up mountains, sometimes through treacherous passages and at other times through beautiful verdure and scenery. They lodged at inns and hotels with wonderful names, but atrocious accommodations and conditions. But everywhere they went, they met with eager believers and baptized many and established new churches. Their most memorable event on this journey was the Wang or King family, a group of around 900 members who lived high up on a mountain in a self-sustaining community. They spent many days there and were treated like royalty. There, Roy and one of the Wang brothers who introduced them to the clan preached to eager listeners and they were able to establish a church there as well. On their final stop before returning home, they entered a remote village where they were greeted by a procession complete with fireworks before and in front, with the whole village coming out to see them. Murti was the first white woman they had ever seen, and the couple were stared at, commented on, and surrounded wherever they went by curious onlookers. It was an unsettling experience for them, but nonetheless, there were baptisms and yet another church established, and the mission work grew. We pick up the story today with chapter 14, entitled, In Peril and Triumph. Home in Changsha, Roy took up the strands of the work in the mission and learned that things had not been standing still during his absence. Murti cleaned her house, arranged all her clothes in order, tended to her little flower garden, and did her part in the mission work. Good reports from churches and companies kept coming in, and one day, two literature evangelists, bubbling over with enthusiasm, bought a glowing report from the vicinity of Tung Ting Lake. In the little city of Hua Young, declared Ho Chu Tang, we sold many books, tracts, and magazines. One businessman invited us to come in and hold meetings in his store. Did you accept his invitation? Roy interposed eagerly. We surely did, was the spirited reply. The people came in crowds, and the Lord was with us, teaching us what to say. Was there any opposition? asked another. Yes, some, returned the eager young man. You know, 
that whenever we get something started for God, the enemy begins to work. Go on, go on, his listeners urged. Well, there are a number of people over there who are keeping the Sabbath, and they want Musi, shepherd, that is Roy, to come and visit them. Turning to Roy, he said, Now if you will just tell us when you can come, they will rent a place for a chapel, and will have everything ready for you. Roy was curious about the sudden interest awakened, and asked the coal porters, Aren't other Christian missions located around there? Oh yes, answered Mr. Ho. There is a large Catholic mission with two Spanish priests in charge. We knew they didn't like our work, but they haven't bothered us much yet. Some time ago, the Baptists opened a chapel in Hua Young, and the Catholics drove them out of town. Then the Christian Alliance folk started an outstation there, and they were driven out. It's bound to be dangerous for us, Mr. Ho added soberly, but I believe the Lord will give us the victory. Since there was only an inkling of trouble, Roy and Murty were not too worried. At the appointed time, they set out on the river steamer for the few hours cruise to Lake Tung Ting. Then they transferred to a houseboat, which made the trip in a night. On Friday, the meetings began, with many interested people attending and continued all day Sabbath. There was no indication yet that trouble was brewing. But on Sunday morning, the services had barely begun when someone near the door shouted, The Catholics are coming! The Catholics are coming! The people, who knew well what had happened to the other Protestant missions in that place, were terrified. The meeting broke up instantly, and pandemonium reigned. Murty retreated and slipped into a little back room to pray. Roy called for the swiftest runner to leave by the rear door and rush to the magistrate's residence a mile away, asking for a hundred soldiers to come and protect the chapel. All natural precautions were quickly taken. The double front doors were first barricaded, but soon they were broken down by the furious mob, who were armed with pitchforks, axes, knives, poles, and any other weapons they could lay their hands on. The situation appeared desperate, and Roy felt that resistance against such a huge force would be useless. Their only hope seemed to be peaceful measures, which might prove to be their best protection. He therefore rushed to the door and cried to the men who were guarding it, Don't fight! Don't fight! Let's try to talk to them. That is our only hope. But one tall young man responded grimly, Shepherd, do you suppose I'm going to stand here and let that wild mob rush in and kill you? They'll walk over my dead body first. I'm going to stand here and fight, and I'll fight to the end. That little group of Christians was like Gideon's army before the vast rabble who had been spurred on by the priests. What they did with the few benches and chairs to hold back the mob at the doorway was a miracle. Yet, they stood their ground. China has usually been considered a land of slow motion and tardy action. But in the incredibly short space of 25 or 30 minutes, a different kind of shout was raised outside. Bing ding lao liao! Bing ding lao liao! The soldiers are coming! The soldiers are coming! Those shouts were like music to the beleaguered missionaries and believers. They could hardly believe their ears. How could the soldiers have gotten there so quickly? But here they came, double quick, with bayonets fixed, and the cowardly mobsters ran for their lives. At the head of his troopers, the captain rushed into the chapel with an air of triumph, shouting, Shepherd, I have come to protect you. Your danger is past. 
Turning to his men, he gave orders for them to stock arms down the center aisle and around the front entrance. Then addressing Roy, and with a puzzled look on his face, he asked, Now, will you tell me all about the troubles? They sat down on one of the chapel benches and were quietly discussing the incident when suddenly a soldier burst into the room and all out of breath cried, Oh, Captain, the Catholics that you drove away have gone over to our barracks and are wrecking them now. There was no more quiet talk. The Captain leaped to his feet, livid with fury. He quickly divided his men into two groups, leaving one to protect the chapel. His commands rang out like staccato pistol shots. Then turning to the little group standing in front of the chapel, he declared with vehemence, Some heads will be rolling before tonight. He spoke in truth, for several did lose their lives over the disgraceful affair. Early that afternoon, the district magistrate sent an armed escort to accompany Roy to his Yamen, or official residence, for a report of the incident. He was deeply concerned, very polite, and most apologetic. By the time Roy returned to the chapel, a delegation from the local Chamber of Commerce had arrived to convey their utmost regrets for the disturbance. They had further news of the Catholic attack. Do you know where those fellows got their weapons? inquired the leader. No, I don't, Roy confessed. Indeed, it had seemed strange that the mob seemed to be equipped with brand new weapons and cudgels. Well, was the reply, they raided a hardware store and a lumberyard. So you weren't the only ones to suffer from prejudice and intolerance. The soldiers remained in the chapel that night, lest some of the marauders return to finish what they had set out to do but they had evidently been effectively squelched by the irate soldiers. In the early gray of the next morning, before even the earliest risers were abroad, a little company of believers escorted Roy and Murty to an obscure boat landing. There, they all knelt in an ardent prayer of thanksgiving. The outcome had greatly strengthened their faith, and they felt more assurance than ever that God would continue to have his hand of protection over them. He shall cover thee with his feathers, reads the promise, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Goodbye was said as the little boat started down the stream, the water softly lapping against the sides. A solemn, anxious-faced group of believers stood on the bank, straining their eyes to see the dim shape of the vanishing boat with its precious cargo. A native pastor and his wife remained to encourage and strengthen the new church. Nor was this the end of the unfortunate incident. British and native newspapers reported the riot in the large cities of China, and very unfavorable publicity was given to the instigators. Provincial authorities in Changsha also made a thorough investigation, and the embarrassed troublemakers were forced to pay damages to the mission. The episode was thoroughly frightening, but as are many of the machinations of the devil, it indirectly brought advancement of the gospel. Murty and Roy felt weak after the affair, so high had the tension mounted. It is not easy on the nerves to face possible death by mob violence. After leaving Hua Yang, the missionaries crossed by steam launch to the southern shore of Tung Ting Lake, where they visited two outstations. At Ning Hsiang, they received an enthusiastic welcome from Mr. and Mrs. Li Young Gun, who had been working among the townspeople. It was amusing to see that in their home, 
the children had a large array of old idols which they were playing with as toys. When new converts were won to Christianity, they brought their idols to the mission station to be disposed of. At this place, a large number awaited baptism. For this service, the company walked some little distance to a swift mountain stream. So swift was the current that as the candidates were immersed, two strong men stood nearby to prevent them from being carried downstream by the rushing waters. Roy had difficulty as well in keeping his footing. Springtime verdure had clothed all nature in its living colors, which served as a background to the beautiful scene. Three members of one family were baptized, a grandmother, her daughter of 36, and the granddaughter, aged nine. All of these had given up their idols and had now discovered greater happiness and a brighter future in following Christ. Summer and fall passed quickly, and by December, Roy was on the road once more. He visited Ning Hsiang again, and there in the icy waters of that same stream, during a heavy snowstorm, 14 more trophies from paganism were baptized. The neighbors and friends, who bundled to the ears, stood on the bank and watched, declared that the candidates would all die from the ordeal. But no one seemed any the worse for his immersion in the chilling water. Again, God's work was elevated in the minds of those who beheld the beautiful rite. One of the young women who fearlessly stepped down into the cold waters had only the night before lost her baby with the dread diphtheria. Though her face was sad and her heart filled with sorrow, she rejoiced in the hope of the resurrection and looked forward with joyful assurance to the day when her baby, blooming with health, would again be placed in her arms. Controlling the anguish of her heart, she bore her beautiful witness to her Savior. Had she remained in paganism, she would doubtless have given herself to loud and uncontrollable weeping for many days. So sorrow those who have no hope. Another year dawned. From the city of Liu Yang, some 50 miles away, came news of a company of people who were reading the Chinese signs of the times and observing the Sabbath. Many were awaiting baptism. In company with the faithful Huang Dizendeo, Roy started out on foot to visit this little flock. A bonded Chinese coolie was secured from a transportation company to carry the roll of bedding, folding cot, and a well-packed lunchbox. Murty knew just what to prepare, for she had a special list of things necessary for journeys so that nothing would be forgotten. All went well until they started going through a wild wooded section. Suddenly, the coolie who had been going ahead was nowhere to be seen. He seemed to have been swallowed up. Where had he gone? Had he departed with their belongings? This seemed unusual. For in old China there was great family loyalty, and fathers, brothers, and relatives would be held strictly accountable for the misdeeds of any member of the clan. But this coolie had indeed absconded and taken all their possessions with him, bedding, food box, soap, shirts, trousers, underwear, night clothes, shoes, socks, and even precious books and writing materials. Then it was forced upon Roy to live a bit differently from usual. For the following eight days, until his return to Changsha, he lived Chinese, talked Chinese, ate Chinese, 
and slept Chinese. It occurred to him during those days that Western civilization imposes upon its people many non-essential customs and habits. Living the simple life, there was no shaving, changing clothes, dressing or undressing. When he went to bed at night, all he had to do was take off his hat and shoes. Nor did this mar the wonderful fellowship he enjoyed with his native brothers and sisters. For the baptism, he borrowed a loose Chinese robe or sanza. Following this rite, another company of believers was organized to shine in all its brightness. Sometime later, the magistrate of that district returned some of the stolen goods together with a small sum of money he had extracted from the thief's relatives. Roy was home only for a few days before he again hit the road. This time, six native workers accompanied him. After visiting two churches, they reached the shore of Tung Ting Lake where they had planned to cross over on a steam launch. But the launch had been seized by a band of outlaws and no one had any idea of its whereabouts. So a small sailboat was secured and in this they set sail while the south wind blew softly. By nightfall they were skimming along toward the north shore of the lake. It had been a pleasant day and all on board were happy and relaxed. Suddenly, without a moment's warning, a terrific gale struck the little ship. One sailor leaped out into the pounding surf, made his way to shore, and tried with all his strength to fasten the boat. Another dropped the anchor. The wind howled like a thousand demons and tossed the boat about as if it were a mere toy. In spite of all the frantic efforts, the small craft was driven before the gale. The mast snapped and fell into the angry waters. Sails went flying into the heart of the tempest. The upper part of the boat was torn off and flung violently into the sea. The boat itself was tossed like a chip and there seemed no possibility of escape from death this time. Above the roar of the storm, the pagan captain shouted to Roy, Pray, shepherd, pray to your God, or we will all soon be on the bottom of this lake. With sinking heart, Roy thought of Murty, of his mother far away, still grieving over the loss of his father. Then the cheering thought came to him of another boat and another storm, where even the winds and the waves obeyed his will. The prince of the power of the air could bow again to the authority of King Jesus. They did pray, believing, and within an hour they were driven onto an island. The storm quieted, and kneeling there on the wet sand, the little company praised God for sparing their lives from what appeared to be certain death. The wife of one of the workers in telling of the incident said, Yes, I prayed, but I prayed in perfect faith, for I was confident that the Lord would never drown our shepherd. Roy, listening, was deeply touched. He lifted up his heart to God in humility, praying, Lord, make me worthy of thy favor and of the love and confidence of these dear people. They learned later that the island was the rendezvous of a nest of pirates and thieves. But the God who directed the boat to safety did not put them in graver danger from the evil men. His protecting hand was over them for good. With the boat shattered and unseaworthy, the marooned passengers wondered what they would do next. Roy needed urgently to be on his way, for in only five days, the Asiatic Division Annual Committee meeting was to convene in Shanghai, and he was expected to be present. 
Again, in answer to prayer, the little group was picked up by a passing cargo boat en route to one of the river ports. Roy reached Shanghai on time, enjoyed the good meetings, and returned home to find that Murti also had been having her share of excitement. One night, she had awakened to hear strange noises outside. Getting up, she peered through the open shutters and saw a man only a few feet away. She was almost paralyzed with fright, but knew she must do something. Slipping quietly into the dark kitchen, she took the big handbell, opened a window, and though trembling with fear, began to ring it vigorously. Missionary C.P. Lilly came on the run, and to Murty's relief, the would-be robber took to his heels. He had not yet broken into the house, but he did have all the porch furniture tied into two stacks convenient for carrying away. This recalled a similar experience of the previous summer. The weather was hot and humid, and Roy had decided to sleep on the veranda. Suddenly he was awakened by the clatter of the bamboo fence. In dry weather, this served as a good burglar alarm. He leaped off the veranda and ran at full speed in the direction of the noise in an effort to overtake the thief. In the moonlight, he saw a form on the fence and rushed forward to seize it. But it was not the thief, only his trousers. The scoundrel had broken into the Cottrell storeroom. Lacking a bag or receptacle in which to carry his loot, he took off his big trousers, tied the ends of the legs, and thus formed a double bag. This he filled to the brim and was making off with it when Roy gave chase. Roy pulled the heavily laden trousers from the fence and he and Murty enjoyed a good laugh. The poor man attempted to make his mistake in a rowboat, but the river police, who were immediately notified, followed in hot pursuit and reported that the thief was shot and killed. At the recent meeting in Shanghai, the committee had voted Roy the money to purchase property suitable for a chapel and the mission headquarters for the Hunan province. The Chinese were happy at the thought that soon they could leave the old, dingy, dirty, rented compound, which had never really been adequate for a chapel and a school. In the quest for a suitable place, the Lord led the searches even as he had done years before in selecting the island site for the mission homes. Their efforts were rewarded in finding a place that exceeded their fondest hopes. It was centrally located on a good street. The building was well constructed and would seat several hundred worshippers. Beside that, it would provide living quarters for several native families. The owner stiffly refused to accept checks or drafts and declared he would accept nothing but the local currency. After a thorough search, Roy found a native bank which provided him with $11,001 bills. It was heavy to carry and still more laborious to count, but the owner was greatly pleased with the acceptable cash and everyone was overjoyed with the splendid, new, roomy headquarters. About this time, some of the members began to talk about Grace Complete, Chuen and Ren, the young lady who had been staying with the Cottrells. She should be joined to her husband, they protested. She has no husband, Murty replied, not understanding them. When she came to live with us, her parents said, that when the proper time came, they wanted us to select a suitable husband for her. Oh, replied one of the native workers, Grace has a husband. I was present at the feast when she was married. She was then about three years old, and the taste of that good feast is still in my mouth. Grace, Murty asked, do you have a husband? The people here say you do. 
I do not have a husband, Grace declared indignantly. I know the things they are saying, but I have always despised that little fellow, and I will never have him for a husband. This was a daring speech, so modern that some of the older people deplored such an attitude. They shook their heads sadly and sighed for the good old days when girls did just as they were told and asked no foolish questions. Roy and Murty were inclined to take Gracie's part. Why should she be compelled to abide by a custom fast becoming outmoded? Of course they realized that in old China, child marriage was considered absolutely binding, and some predicted darkly that if Grace did not take this young man for her husband, she would bring a terrible scandal upon the church. Roy and Murty realized that old customs could not be changed or flouted without some damage. While they were pondering and praying over this predicament, hardly knowing what to advise, Pastor Lee Yu Gun offered a suggestion. Let me tell you, Shepherd, he said confidentially to Roy, this lad Wang and Hisi, Sabbath King, is really a likable fellow. He lives over near the town where I'm holding meetings. How would it be for me to bring him with me the next time I come to Changsha? That's a good idea, Roy answered. I'll be pleased to meet him. A few weeks later, here came big congenial Li Yu Gun, and with him a smiling, round-faced young man. Shepherd, began the preacher, let me introduce you to my friend Sabbath King. His father was the first Christian and the first Christian martyr in this entire province. He was a good man, and one Sunday morning before his death, this little lad was born in his home. He was happy and eager to witness for his Lord, so he named the little boy Sabbath. Shepherd, the good man continued, that was a long time before the message of the true Sabbath came to this part of China. And Brother King, believing Sunday to be the Lord's true rest day, gave the new baby this appropriate name, Sabbath. A good name, commented Roy, and the lad's face was shining. Now, Shepherd, I think that Father gave him a good prophetic name. And if the church will only give him a good Christian education, one of these days he will become a real ambassador for the Sabbath of the King of Kings. Roy was amused and impressed by the clever speech and by the handsome, amiable young man. For a time, Sabbath King attended the mission school at Changsha, and later he was admitted to the China Union Seminary in Shanghai. While there, he was able to work most of his way through school by setting type in the nearby publishing house. Grace maintained her opposition to Wang Han Si for some time, but the boy's zeal for God and remarkable progress finally won her heart. After graduating from college, the young man entered mission employ, and Grace Complete gladly became Mrs. Sabbath King. Later, they were sent to new fields in the far western part of China. Wang Hansi was eventually ordained to the gospel ministry, and with his good wife, worked happily and effectively, winning many precious souls. What has now transpired behind that bamboo curtain, God only knows. One thing is certain, God still has kings in China. With the passing years, their children in turn became efficient workers in educational and publishing lines. Until the communists entered China, Sabbath King continued to correspond with the Cottrells in America. The End 
of chapter 14 of Pioneers Together.